the World Economic Forum, and which is a, a whole group. It's essentially the best way to describe it is that it's a business roundtable, an international business roundtable. You know how we've got business roundtable in New Zealand? They renamed themselves New Zealand Initiative, and they're set up um, essentially to lobby on behalf of um, larger employers and and um, and larger businesses in this country. Um, well, the World Economic Forum is a bit the same way. So it's got all the massive multinational companies that join it, and they have a particular worldview. And their worldview is, if I was to characterise it, it is we need more capitalism, not less. Um, that even though we are big multinational corporates, um, we've always got competition. And uh, that competition is a good thing. And yeah, as long as the economy is growing, we are growing, growth is a good thing. The argument of this, of the United Nations Secretary General, and it really was quite explicit last night in his address to the United Nations General Assembly, um, and of Jonathan Boston and other public policymakers in our universities at the moment is, you carry on that way and there is nothing but death and destruction because you can no longer continue to extract things from the earth, burn or consume them. You can only do it once. There's a finite amount of it. And some of the unforeseen consequences of, for example, the reliance on fossil fuels uh, have directly imperiled humanity um, in toto because of the greenhouse gases being emitted in that particular case. But the United Nations is also arguing something a bit more specific about that. They're saying, well, yeah, but it's also our economic system. Our economic system encourages what you might call extractive industries. Uh, it encourages industries and practices, whether they be commercial, agricultural, um, political. It encourages processes whereby you've got to keep on growing. And essentially they're arguing it's a bit like the old tulip strategy. Capitalism must collapse upon itself because you can't continue to grow because the resources won't be there to allow you to do so. Um, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, listen, the reason I'm discussing it and the reason I, um, I read it yesterday, I, I wanted um, Jonathan Boston on the program, was to, to look at that. Um, you might have thought, well, Jonathan Boston, he's an academic, he's going to think like that. You know, they don't live in the real world. That's why they teach at universities. Mm, except the United Nations Chief's address to the General Assembly essentially picked up that theme and ran with it last night uh, as well. So joining us on the program this morning, and a big welcome too, is Jonathan Boston. Uh, Jonathan, first of all, are you a professor or a doctor or both? Oh, well, kia ora, Michael. I'm now emeritus professor, actually. Uh, I retired from full-time academic work at the beginning of this year, and I'm now semi-retired. Um, and I do have a PhD, which means, yes, I uh, have a... I'm called Doctor, but you can call me what you like. <laughs> Just don't call me late for dinner. Um, now, Jonathan, I, the reason I've asked you to come on the show, or you would have heard my introduction on this, is that yes. you um, uh, and uh, your colleague penned um, Jason Hickel, uh, a very, well, and I guess you were going to a conference and you penned some thoughts about essentially arguing that capitalism has come to the end of its useful purpose and that humanity needs to find another way. Is, is, is that, uh, is that the, the basic theme of what you argued? Uh, well, it, no, Michael, to be honest. It, it's, it's the, certainly it's the argument of people like Jason Hickel, um, but it's, it's not mine. Okay. So, All right. uh, to the extent, to the extent, Michael, that I have been sort of pigeonholed as a degrowther of the sort of Hickel variety, actually, that's that's not accurate. Uh, I've I've written quite a uh, a long article which was published in Policy Quarterly earlier this year, which which sets out uh, the debate between people who promote green growth and people who promote degrowth. And I've tried very, very carefully to distinguish what the sort of advocates of these two positions are saying. And I've concluded by saying um, that 
the jury is the jury is out um that we we don't know whether or not green growth is going to be uh possible in other words we don't know yet whether we can continue to expand uh, gdp at the global level uh, while securing uh, ecological sustainability um, you know by mid-century or something like that we in my view we simply don't know and there's a variety of reasons for that i'm happy to talk about yeah no no well, well, why, um, why but, don't but why don't we know that, yeah well can i just say footnote to this if we fail globally to achieve uh, a sufficient measure of ecological sustainability then there is no question that the global economy will be um, significantly impacted and that will almost certainly mean declining GDP per capita. In other words, if, if we do not protect the capacity of this planet to preserve life uh, in a habitable climate, um, if, we, if we fail, then there will be massive economic consequences and, of course, political, social and other consequences. Now, going to your question michael why why can't we be sure well uh there's a variety of reasons for that one of them is technical we we don't yet know whether we're going to be able to do certain sorts of things and do them cheaply enough to to make them viable so one of those is uh the question of can we go uh, negative net emissions so you'll be aware and listeners will be aware that the uh global community has essentially um said you know we have to get greenhouse gas emissions particularly carbon dioxide emissions down to very low levels sort of by mid-century uh, and if we're to uh, avoid um, more than say two degrees of warming uh we're going to have to actually go to negative net emissions that means we're going to have to take uh, uh carbon dioxide particularly out of the atmosphere um and put it underground in safe locations. And, and there are two ways currently available uh, for uh, undertaking that kind of exercise. One is called direct air carbon capture and storage, and the other is um, uh, bioenergy uh, carbon capture and storage. The latter is essentially growing trees, burning them, capturing the carbon dioxide and putting it underground and doing that on a continuous basis over many decades. Direct uh, air capture uh, for carbon dioxide, uh, sorry, and, and capture um, uh, CCS. Carbon capture and storage is uh, where you uh, have you know, very large equipment which captures carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then uh, converts it into um, uh, solid form and you put it underground. So, so one of the reasons, this is just one of the reasons, Michael. Jonathan, why can I just pick, it, pick up on that straight yeah. away, though? Because uh, just to explain mm -hmm. to our listeners, there are machines, mm -hmm. as I understand it, that are being made and operational now doing exactly that. Is that right? Uh, in the United States? On a, yes. Uh, for example, in Iceland, but on an incredibly small scale and at great cost. Mm. So as I understand it, Michael, and I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, direct air capture uh, and so on, um, but my understanding is that the technology at the moment is very much in its infancy, infancy yeah. and that it's using, it's using more carbon dioxide <laughs> to capture the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere than is actually being captured. So at the moment, we haven't got equipment, as I understand it, and I may be wrong, but as I understand it, we haven't got equipment for direct air capture uh, of carbon dioxide that, that yet um, is, 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 is making a positive contribution to solving the problem. Now, we may well. So one of the big issues, Michael, is uh, how much faith can we have uh, that, A, we can apply the existing technologies we have uh, appropriately and fast enough uh, to decarbonize uh, the global economy um, by mid-century. And the second is, uh, to what extent can we have confidence that new technologies will develop uh, that will assist us uh, both in the next 30 years but also beyond uh, mid-century. And, uh, you know, uh, some people are technological sort of optimists and, and some people are, if you like, technological pessimists. And I'd be fair to say, in broad terms, and this is very broad, advocates of green growth tend to be technological optimists. They, they, they tend to think, uh, you know, the technologies will, that we need <laughs> will be found and will be uh, developed and applied quickly enough. And many degrowthers would say, no, we can't have that kind of confidence. Um, it's, it's unlikely 
and, and so they're you know technological pessimists. Okay, and you're saying the jury's still out on whether or not the green growth yes. or the degrowth is are right. Um, yes. The Except that if we <coughs> fail to achieve sustainability at a global level, then that will have profound impacts on the economy, which means, in effect, we will be having degrowth in the sense of a contraction of global GDP. If I was listening to you, though, as a politician and a policymaker, Jonathan, and I asked mm. you for advice and you gave me that advice, I would be leaving the room no more uh, advanced on what was the right choice to take because you're saying... Not all the evidence is there yet to make that decision. When do you expect that decision to be made with the evidence available? Well, let's be clear. There are two different things here, Michael. The, 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 the point I've been making is that it's not clear to me yet, and it won't be for probably several decades, whether a green oh, okay. growth strategy yeah. that yeah. Is, 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 is going to work. Right. But, but, but there's a second issue, though, which is when it comes to advice, most degrowthers and advocates of green growth are in broad agreement on quite a lot of what needs to be done. Um, so, you know, for example, they broadly accept, you know, we, are, we have to live within biophysical limits at the planetary level and indeed at subplanetary levels. We have to we're not currently doing that. Therefore, we have to make pretty radical changes, which includes decarbonisation. That means reducing uh, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions, and particularly carbon dioxide, uh, radically over a relatively short period of time. We also have to reduce uh, other sort of environmental impacts and resource use. Um, so, for example, even something like sand. If we continue to use sand at the current rate, I'm told we will run out of sand uh, by the end of the century. And there are many other resources where if we continue to use them at the current rate, I mean, they would simply run out or, and or we'd do enormous environmental damage securing them. So, so going back to my sort of second point, there, there, there is broad agreement on the kinds of policy changes which need to be made. Um, and they include things like having effective em emissions trading schemes or other price-based mechanisms to put a price on environmental externalities like carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. They include things like uh, radically reshaping our transport systems with a much greater reliance on public transport, on active transport, cycling and, and, and running and walking, um, and much less use on uh, individual private vehicle ownership. Uh, they include major changes in other consumption patterns, um, the type of food we eat. Okay, well, uh, and, now, and, so that's, and that's what and, I wanted and, to... And, 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 well, let's, yeah. get, let's get to specifics then, Jonathan, because yeah. it, it, it almost seems to me that there's no difference between green growth and degrowth because of the prescription for green growth would essentially degrow New Zealand. Can I give an example? Um, you, well, public mm. transport's a, a, a good example where you'd have to heavily subsidise that because at the moment it just doesn't work in terms of New Zealand's stretched out, small pop, relatively small population stretched out over, what is it, 1,200 miles or whatever. But I want to take you to food. Yes, sure. I want to take you to food. Uh, you're quoted as saying, we would need to move predominantly to vegetarian diets with much reduced consumption yes. of meat and dairy, so plant-based diets globally as well as locally. Um, yes. Let's just take that one as an example. It, you know, as you know, we're an agricultural yep. economy. Uh, it's very much based, our economy is based upon trading, uh, the kind of goods that you're suggesting we probably shouldn't be trading in. Doesn't that essentially deflate the New Zealand economy and the cost of living, well, sorry, the standard of living here, if we moved to that? Well, if, it, it, it might if we did it badly, Michael, and if we didn't invest in new areas of economic activity which replace the current areas of activity which are environmentally unsustainable. I mean, if you take dairying, for example, and forgive me, as you know, I'm not an expert in the area of sort of agricultural economics and, and, um, and dairying in particular, but we know that in parts of the country we are doing enormous damage to our uh, rivers and, and, and waterways. Uh, and that that damage will only escalate over time um, if we fail to make significant changes to farming practice 
and, and land use. We know uh, currently that um, uh, sheep and cattle produce significant quantities of uh, methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas. And, and that from a global point of view, we're going to have to reduce uh, methane emissions and nitrous oxide emissions um, significantly, albeit not necessarily to zero. Um, so, so, Michael, I mean, the point here is, first of all, the land use in New Zealand is going to have to change, and it, and it is changing. I mean, there's going to be more trees, more uh, sort of reserves and so on, and, and almost certainly uh, fewer uh, cattle and, and probably fewer sheep. Uh, globally, which is what really matters from the point of view of, you know, um, uh, ecological sustainability at a planetary level, globally, uh, we could not sustain um, uh, a, a global population with diets of the kind that we have in much of the Western world at the moment. It would simply not be possible. So my, my fundamental point here is that um, uh, at a global level, we're going to have to rely very heavily on plant-based diets rather than on, um, uh, you know, meat and dairy products. Can I, can I take you back um, one? I sit for, on a regional... For, 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 for sustainability. So okay. I'm, I'm not interested in, you know, damaging the New Zealand economy, but from a long-term point of view, we're going to have to make significant changes, and those changes are going to have to be uh, based on, you know, really good science, really good evidence, um, a recognition of environmental externalities such as water pollution, um, greenhouse gas emissions and so on. And, and currently, Michael, we're not. I mean, you know very well, uh, we've polluted uh, very badly many of our rivers and waterways. And, and, and um, essentially now we're going to be faced with a very substantial cleanup cost over, over multiple generations. I mean, it's going to take the Waikato River, how many years? 80 to 100 years to be cleaned up. Um, you know, and, and the people who are going to pay that are not the people who have made money out of farming. Okay, can I take you back one, though? I sit on a re you, yeah. you, you might not be aware, but I sit on a regional council, so I've, I'm at, coming at to the end of a second term. Um, surely right. you can have your cake and eat it too, Jonathan. For example, you've talked about we, we need to basically de-stock livestock. But isn't it also possible that you can keep the same amount of livestock doing what you're doing? You just need to change the farming practices that do pollute rivers and streams? Well, uh, Michael, I'm, I'm not an ecologist, but, you know, the, the material I read uh, tells me a number of things. One of them is that uh, at the moment we, we lack the technologies to dramatically reduce greenhouse gas emissions from, from livestock agriculture. Now, it may be that we will develop those technologies. I'm I mean, there are certain technologies uh, and, and, and processes and procedures that, that, that can uh, significantly reduce methane and nitrous oxide emissions, but, but not necessarily to the level that, that would be desirable. And this is one of the reasons why farmers are so concerned about, you know, having a, a price on, on methane and nitrous oxide, because, because their concern is that they don't have the means to kind of reduce uh, those um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, as, as much as will probably be necessary in the, in, the, in the medium to long term. So, and the second thing, Michael, you know, you're sitting on a regional council, uh, just the extent to which we have damaged um, the waterways and aquifers and so on in this country. Now, we don't necessarily have to destock everywhere, but almost certainly we're going to have to destock where we are, uh, where we have livestock agriculture that is inconsistent with uh, the soil types and uh, absorptive capacity of, of the soils and so on and so on. Mm, but um, I would, yeah, I would have, is yeah, I see. Case in point. But from a public policy point of view, I would have thought you handle that a different way, and that is that you impose strict environmental standards, uh, and then say you've got to farm within those rather than you have to just stop. Sure. I mean, it's it, it, the nature of New Zealand agriculture. Well, except, yeah, but the nature of New Zealand yes. agriculture has been that they are relatively innovative folk um, who ha mm. deal with uh, and have a very very strong research base as well. So they are sure. constantly evolving sure. new ways of doing things to whatever the stimuli is. If, if environmental sure. factors are one of those stimuli, Jonathan, I'd argue, well, they'll simply adapt or create. And I'm th we're, for example, Lincoln University working on methane, um, reducing methane through a combination of sure. either breeding sure. or of stock supplement. 
I mean, those are the sorts of things sure, where you sure. expect technology to play a, a proactive role in the future, wouldn't you? A absolutely, and I, I completely agree. Um, but we aren't there yet. That is to say, you no, know, no, we we're not in a position of having cows that, that can <coughs> uh, produce you know, milk efficiently and effectively without producing methane. So, so, you know, we're in a transition period. And this goes back to my previous comments, Michael, about whether, you know, one's a technological optimist or, or, or not. For those who think, yes, technology will solve the problem, well, okay, um, uh, you're, you're entitled to your optimism. <laughs> but what if you're wrong? <laughs> yeah, but, but, uh, well, but what if I'm right? Um, I, 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 I don't want to destroy the economy in the meantime, do I? No, but we have to, we have to, from a strategic point of view, set ourselves on a path that is going to get us where we need to be uh, in some decades' time. And, and in that context, Michael, I'm in complete agreement with you that the way to do this is you, you set uh, a regulatory framework and a pricing framework that sends the appropriate signals and, and, and provides the constraints uh, on activity that you need. And if we had applied... Uh, you know, proper pricing of greenhouse gas emissions in the agricultural sector several decades ago, and if we'd applied appropriate pricing and regulatory uh, approaches to water use and and um, runoff, um, well, we wouldn't have uh, the the kind of problems we have, for example, in Canterbury uh, that that we now have, Michael. Uh, and and my concern here, from an equity point of view, is in a sense we've, we we we're allowing we. We, we've allowed lots of people, well, that's a small number of people, to make an awful lot of money <laughs> at the public's expense. In other words, in the form of uh, uncontrolled or very poorly controlled environmental externalities. And, and uh, we, we're leaving a very large ecological debt uh, to, to those who follow us. And I'm talking now globally as well as locally. Mm. Um, and, and it may well be, Michael, that if New Zealand can come up with technological solutions to, uh, you know, water pollution and, and um, greenhouse gas emissions from livestock um, farming, uh, that we may be able to continue uh, to uh, have, you know, a significant <laughs> um, amount of livestock farming in New Zealand on a long-term basis and continue to make significant sums of money uh, from, from exporting um, uh, the products from livestock farming. Can, but, can, can uh, I say though that uh, re the yeah. rhetoric they hear is quite interesting for me, and that is looking again from mm. the outside in. Um, the reality is that um, when you say people have made a lot of money out of it, well, the whole New Zealand has made a lot of money out of our agricultural and dairying industries. But going forward, um, you've talked about converting also large amounts of, well, I guess what's farmland now, into um, into regeneration of bush. Um, do you still do you still think that's necessary? If we've, I mean, you're talking essentially about converting large areas of current farming land into what forest plantations and the like. Well, or also um, uh, crop. Cropping, Michael. I mean, if you looked at the Canterbury Plains, you know, 30 years ago, before the intensification of dairying, mm. it was essentially used for for sheep and mm. and for crops. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, I'm not wanting to dictate <laughs> exactly how any particular piece of land is used. I, I'm with you that if you put in place an appropriate regulatory framework and pricing framework, you will send signals that will undoubtedly significantly change land use in New Zealand. No question. Exactly how that land use is changed, um, well, it, it will depend on the technologies you have available, uh, the exact sort of the pricing signals that we have in place, the regulatory framework. But it will change, Michael, and there will be areas that are currently farmed which will be, um, you know, farmed for trees instead of, instead of cattle or sheep. Uh, there will be areas which have been used um, for livestock agriculture that will become cropping land again, uh, uh, etc., um, can I can I test you on something yeah, else though? Because it, it, it seems there's a mm. we're talking also about um, what we call transitional transitional equity um, and moving yes. forward. You know who's going to get hurt? What's what's the result of this, uh, etc. Does New Zealand need yes. to lead in this? Because one of the things that was interesting to me was that we could easily have, because food production is exempt from the international climate agreements, but we decided to put it in. 
We also decided to unilaterally declare that a five metre tree was okay, but anything under that wasn't. Don't we want to step in place with the rest of the world rather than lead it in these areas? Well, look, be, be careful here, Michael, because in terms of the work of the Intergovernmental Government, Panel on Climate Change, my reading of, of their most recent report, the sixth assessment report, is that um, we're going to have to reduce um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, uh, across the board, not just carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is the most significant kind of long-term uh, gas, and that, that is absolutely crucial that we... We, we reduce, but yeah. we're going to also have to reduce at a global level our methane emissions, nitrous oxide emissions, nitrous oxide of course is a long lived gas and, and other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so if, if we fail, Michael, well then we'll continue to warm the planet and the more we, more we warm the planet, as you know, the more damage no, we will do. Sorry, that's, that's, oh, you misunderstood um, the question, Jonathan, that's not what I meant. I meant as in, I don't think right. New Zealanders mind doing their bit. I think when they think that other countries who are going to be much more influential in this aren't doing their bit. They tend to get a bit ha. And I'm thinking in particular mm. of China, India, Russia, the United States, the world's largest emitters and polluters, um, who are sure. not being held to the same standards as ourselves. And I'm just asking from a public policy point of view whether you think that's mm. equitable. Look, these are very difficult questions. I, I think from a New Zealand Inc. kind of point of view, what I'd be saying is we need to think where we are going to need to be in 30 or 40 years' time uh, and where we need to be at that time frame where we can continue to function as a resilient, you know, productive, uh, reasonably prosperous uh, society and economy. And, and then work back, if you like, Michael, sort of back casting and saying, okay, if we need to be kind of at net zero or negative net emissions, you know, by 2050 or 2060, whatever, um, how do we get there? And what, what are the things we're going to have to change to get there? Um, sort of regardless of whether the rest of the world gets there or, or gets there at the same time frame. And bear in mind also, Michael, that at the international level, there are going to be moves to have, uh, you know, what are called, you know, border adjustments for countries that are not seen to be play, paying, their, playing, playing, paying their way uh, in terms of decarbonisation and so on. So the European Union has already got in place um, measures that, that will come into force um, against countries that, that are seen to be failing uh, to be good international citizens. And New Zealand would be vulnerable um, to those sorts of border adjustments. You know, I've, I, heard that, I heard that argument yesterday. Yeah, I heard that argument yesterday. I don't believe it. Mm. Um, primarily because... Well, our major, what don't you believe? I, what don't you believe? Well, A, that it, that would occur, because essentially uh, if the argument is that you'd weaponise um, environmental policies uh, as, a, as a tariff barrier. But our major yes. trading partners, our major trading partners, uh, are no better than we are in terms of their response to the international climate agreements. In fact, you might argue they are very much worse. The United States, yes, Australia, you have to think China. Kind of, sure, sure, Michael. No, no, I understand. But you also have to think about you know, how the landscape is going to change politically over the next 10, 15 years. As the impacts of climate change increase and increase kind of exponentially rather than in a linear manner, uh, more and more countries <coughs> are going to be more and more concerned uh, uh, about along their long-term you know sustainability and as as that happens it won't just be the european union that's threatening border adjustments for countries that are failing uh to pull their weight uh there'll be other countries the united states uh, for example um uh, canada uh japan and so on so uh, you know we, we we shouldn't underestimate uh you know what the impact of increasing anxiety about the long run is going to do at the political level um, in various jurisdictions. Now, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future, but I can, I can anticipate what might happen in the light of what we can reasonably assume is going to happen in relation to climate change impacts and growing concern, particularly about sea level rise, Michael, which is going to be one of the most damaging uh, impacts here. So I, I, think, I think as we see more fires, more floods, more storms, more damage uh, globally, uh, you know, more situations where countries can't use their rivers because uh, for, for transport like the Rhine or the Yangtze because of profound droughts, 
you know, we, we will simply see more and more political pressure coming on at the national level to make changes and then at the national level to, to uh, encourage other countries uh, through whatever means are available uh, to pull their weight. So where we are now in 2022 is going to be different to where we're going to be in 2032 or 2042, Michael. And and so you know this. this oh, no, I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. With, where, where, yeah, I'm not disagreeing with what you say you know, on that. We, I'm just saying to you, I'd like us to be moving hmm. at the same pace as everybody else, not at the lead at the start well, of the pack, disadvantaging New Zealanders by doing so. You don't it, agree? It's very hard to know, Michael. Here, you know, <laughs> whether it's it's better to be a leader or a fast follower or a, or, 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 or a, or a lagger. <laughs> um, my suspicion is that uh, there, there are going to be advantages uh, in being, in being uh, you know, towards the leader of the pack. Um, uh, economic, uh, political, uh, and, and, uh, and other advantages. I may be wrong, Michael, but I, I think <laughs> the, the sooner we can, begin, yeah. we can begin the transition that we need to make, particularly in the sort of land use area, and also transport, which is absolutely fundamental from a carbon dioxide point of view, um, the better off we're going to be. All right. Um, you John, know, so... so uh, no, I, I yeah. appreciate... Uh, listen, I appreciate the time you've given to us I, 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 and, and your argument. I appreciate the logic with which you've used. Uh, we won't always agree on what the solutions are, but I'd like to keep in contact with you because, as you say, the space is evolving. And your views, I yes. guess, will evolve too, depending on what those new facts might be as they do. But thank you for your time this morning, of uh, Professor Boston. All right. Much appreciated. Okay. All right, Michael. All the best. You too. Thanks very much. Okay. Jonathan Boston, there you go.